Frick from University of Maryland Extension. I'm the Master Gardener Coordinator in Allegheny County. And then we've got our lovely Ashley Bodkins, who's the Master Gardener Coordinator in Garrett County. And uh, we like to talk a little bit about the Master Gardener Program, just so, uh, to familiarize you with it, in case you, you don't know a lot about it. But it is part of the University of Maryland Extension. And we are out of the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources. And Ooh. under uh, our Master Gardener programming, you'll often find uh, that we do programming under these various topics, uh, such as pollinators, composting, native plants, baywise, grow it, eat it. Uh, this particular presentation today would be considered a grow it, eat it program. And then we also like to go out into the community and do plant clinics, whether it's at libraries or farmers markets or, or where have you, where uh, we can engage with folks and talk to them about plants and any kind of pest or disease issues they might be having with their plants. Next slide, please, Ashley. Okay, so today we're gonna focus on cucurbits uh, in our vegetable garden. I love this picture. I took this at um, uh, a fair in uh, Ohio, it was in the fall, and they just had lots of beautiful pumpkins and I love trucks, so I couldn't resist. So anyway, next slide, Ashley. Okay, and can I just uh, interrupt and say that we are going to record this presentation. So um, I hit record a little bit ago. Anybody who is participating is giving us uh, your consent uh, by being part of the, the recording. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you. Yep, so we're going to talk about pumpkins and cucumbers and all that great stuff today. Uh, just pumpkins make me happy. So <laughs> I'm going to be excited about this. On this slide, this uh, once again just shows you that we're part of... Uh, University of Maryland College of Agriculture and Natural Resources, and you've got our contact information there on the slide. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, at this point of the uh, presentation, we need to stop and um, just let you know that we do receive federal funding. And um, because of that, we're required to collect demographic information for the participants in our programs, just because we want to ensure that our programs are delivered in a non-discriminatory way. And it also helps us to, to measure the effectiveness of um, how we're offering our programs, to make sure that they're offered inclusively. So at this time, we're gonna ask if you would like to um, consent to participate, give you an option to self-identify at this time. You do not have to do this. This is voluntary. So uh, Ashley has brought the poll up. So if you could please answer the following questions, there's six questions, uh, we would be very grateful. So we'll just take a moment to do that. And when we feel like uh, most of you have responded that are going to, then we'll, we'll move on. But um, it's beautiful weather out there and I am getting excited. I went uh, plant shopping this weekend, came home with 30 perennials. Can't wait to get out in my garden and plant them. I'm trying to transition from, um, or to deer resistant plants. I'm just tired of uh, going out and being disappointed that the deer are eating all my flowers. So uh, that's, that's so exciting. Project. When you told me 30, I was just like, <laughs> What? 30 plants. That's awesome. I know. It's going to be a lot of work, but it'll be worth it. Yes, that's so exciting. It will reduce my frustration levels. <laughs> yes, and that's always makes for happier gardeners. That's right. And that picture, I didn't realize you had taken that on our cover slide. So that's beautiful. That's an awesome picture. Yeah, um, I was trying to remember the name of it. It's the Country Living Fair. They, they have in Columbus. Um, they also have one down south, and it's just, it's a fun fair to go to. Beautiful, just beautiful. Even though we're not going to rush into the fall season, it is a, definitely yeah, right. a beautiful time. <laughs> right. Still looking forward to summer. <laughs> it's almost here. Exactly. All right, folks. Well, we, um, there are six questions, so if you get to the end and you need to hit submit, um, just to give you a couple more seconds to um, complete it. So it looks like there's a few people that have started but haven't hit submit yet. So. All right, Sherry, I think we can probably go ahead and move on. All righty, then I think I'm going to hand it over to you, Ashley. Oh, how about that? That's right. <laughs> I'm glad you're here to keep me on 
keep me on track. Yep, I'll, right. uh, I'll uh, try to answer questions in the chat if you have questions. Yep, please feel free to enter them um, anytime while either one of us is speaking. And um, if it's something we don't know, we will address it at the end. So, all right, as Sherry said, we are so excited today to be talking about, again, warm season crops. So this is probably our first class where we're focusing only on warm season vegetables. And in Garrett County, that is a, kind of a very short window. Uh, so we have a very short growing season here in Western Maryland where we probably have only, um, you know, maybe 100 days if we're lucky uh, from frost to frost. Uh, and that could be, you know, maybe pushing it some days. So when we talk about some of these uh, long season, warm uh, season crops, so things like cantaloupe and watermelons um, and things like that, Sherry's going to talk a lot about um, winter squash and that sort of thing as well. But just be mindful that um, you want to look at those days to maturity and pick ones that are going to mature in a shorter time frame to be sure that you're going to actually get a harvest after you do all this work to, to grow them. So again, any plant in this Kirkabasia family that we're going to be talking about today uh, is going to prefer, prefer warm soil temperatures. And they are going to be uh, plants that you may want to start inside a couple weeks earlier to get a jump on the growing season, uh, but definitely not something that you have to do. So as we started all of our uh, vegetable series classes this, this spring, we want to point out this uh, Grow It, Eat It, the vegetable planting calendar. Again, this is for Central Maryland, so you may need to adjust the dates just a little bit. Uh, so if you're here in Western Maryland, you might want to move these uh, dates to move the bars about two weeks to the right. So in, for example, for cabbage, instead of starting the seeds directly uh, for transplants, you don't want to do that uh, in February. You want to do that more towards, you know, the beginning of March. Uh, so some of the plants we're going to be talking about today will be our squashes. So as you can see, they germinate very quickly. The days in red uh, show you how many days to germination uh, and the days in green or how many days until harvest. Uh, so we're going to roll right into why we want to plant some of these. Uh, but to start off, uh, most of these plants come from three different uh, genuses uh, in the same family, Cucurbaceaceae. Oh man, I did bad on that. Sherry, maybe you can help me do better with it. Um, but Probably not. <laughs> uh, so we're going to call them cucurbits. And so we have the genus cucurbitia, which uh, is summer squash, winter squash, and gourds. And then cucumis, which is muskmelons, honeydew, and cucumbers. And then citrullellus, uh, which is the watermelon genus. So you can see where they came from different parts of the world. So that's why they're a little bit different. Uh, but when it comes to growing them, we get to treat them pretty much the same. So same soil conditions, a lot of the same insect pests, and a lot of the same uh, diseases that you need to watch out for. So again, all the plants we're going to be talking about or all the plants in this family would be cucumbers, winter and summer squash, pumpkins, muskmelon, cantaloupe, watermelon, gourds, uh, just a lot of really, really fun plants. Uh, the one downfall I would say to this family is that uh, unless you get a specific variety, uh, you may have a hard time keeping them contained. So they take up a lot of space. Uh, not to say that you don't get a lot of vegetables or a lot of things that you can harvest off of them. So that's a good thing uh, for space because you're going to get a lot of stuff off of them. But if you have a small vegetable garden, it may be something that you decide not to grow. So what are some other reasons uh, to grow them? One would be that one plant is going to produce a lot, like we talked about. Uh, the second one is that there are tons and tons and tons of fun varieties and fun shapes and fun colors and just um, things like that that you probably won't be able to find just in your in your grocery store. Uh, you may be able to visit some farmers markets and, and get uh, some of those different varieties and shapes and sizes. But, um, you know, if you don't grow them yourself, it's not going to you're not going to have nearly the, the choices. So that's one reason. The other reason is that they are really easy. Uh, so basically, you know, you put them out there, you have a lot of sunshine, again, six to eight hours of sun, a decent soil. They're not super needy as far as that goes, uh, but they do need a good bit of moisture. Uh, some other reasons is that they are versatile. So, uh, you know, even like zucchini flowers can be eaten. So that's kind of fun. And definitely not something that you're gonna find readily available in a grocery store or something like that. 
So hopefully uh, you are joining us and you're already excited about this uh, family of plants. But just in case you aren't and you need a few more uh, pointers, uh, we're gonna go over some planting tips. Uh, so again, six to eight hours of direct sunlight. Uh, the more sunshine you give these guys, the, the happier they're gonna be. Uh, you cannot put them out though until after your last killing frost, unless you're gonna be covering them in some way. They are very frost sensitive. So, you know, unfortunately don't even think about it until the soil is nice and warm and you know that there's not gonna be any more killing frosts. So here in Garrett County, that's gonna be after Memorial Day, most generally. And, uh, you know, for further east, I would say like Allegheny County and further, further to the east, it's probably around Mother's Day uh, that you can start planting them outside. Uh, one of the other um, points that I wanted to say was, you know, you can put them in rows, but traditionally most people put them in hills. So you're gonna hill up the soil, uh, which kind of makes it more three-dimensional, which makes sense because that's gonna help warm the soil up a little quicker, help keep it, you know, so water doesn't lay in a puddle or anything like that and make the roots rot. Uh, so hilling a lot of the plants in this family is a good idea. And um, floating row cover, we mentioned that for early on in the season, uh, but all of the plants in this family have to be pollinated uh, and cross-pollinated a lot of times. So you need to make sure that you take that row cover off or give them some sort of an entrance so that they can get in, so that the pollinators can get into uh, those, the flowers, okay? Uh, the other thing I'll say is that these plants do very, um, they can suffer from transplant shock, especially if you're messing with their roots a lot. So if you are going to start them, you know, inside a few weeks early, I usually recommend that people use something like a jiffy pot or a newspaper container, uh, something that you're going to be able to put directly into the ground. Um, I've started plants, you know, three or four weeks earlier and then planted and mess with the roots, you know, like put them in just a regular plastic container and transplanted them like you would a tomato plant or, you know, a pepper plant or something like that. And I have awful luck. <laughs> I can plant them directly in the ground um, and, you know, have them catch up almost. So don't mess with the roots. That's, that's my advice. Uh, the other kind of cool thing is my great grandma always told me that with cucumbers, you should plant them on the longest day of the year. So, you know, June 21st, when you have the most sunshine. So that was always her goal or, or what she always said in the garden. So I think that's always kind of cool to, to share with people too. So again, fertilizer needs, they're moderate. They're not going to be super heavy feeders. Uh, again, they usually need a little more nitrogen than some of our other plants, so think about that, but you don't want to over fertilize them because that can cause too much excessive growth and not enough uh, fruit set. Uh, so we always recommend a soil test if you haven't done that uh, and always apply your nutrients based on a soil test. So some cool things about the flowers and how these uh, plants in this family are fertilized. So if you've ever noticed, um, maybe you have or maybe you haven't, but like cucumbers and squash and, and all of the plants in this family on the female flowers, before they're even pollinated, you're gonna notice that there is a baby fruit there. So that's an easy way to see if it's a male or a female flower. And as we get more into this, um, there's a lot of big terms that we can talk about, uh, but the first word is monoecious. So most cucumbers and squash and even watermelon are monoecious. So that means that they have a separate male and a separate female flower on the same plant. So I know a lot of people get really excited, especially for the, like the first zucchini and the first um, yellow squash and that sort of thing out of their garden. And if you're one of these gardeners that gets super excited, maybe you've noticed that uh, the flowers sometimes will die and you'll think what what happened to that flower why didn't I get a squash or something like that so that's mother nature's way of ensuring that there's enough pollen available a lot of times your your cucumbers and your squash will put out only male flowers for like the first week and then later on you'll start to see uh, you know the female flowers coming on so there's nothing wrong with your plants uh, that's just mother nature's way um, and then we have this next word andromonaceous uh, which means male flowers open first and again Sometimes this is going to be like on perfect flowers or imperfect flowers, but this is going to be on musk melons mainly. And then we have gynoecious flowers, which are all female flowers. So this isn't nearly as common, you know, on most varieties, 
Uh, but commercial growers often will use these varieties of plants uh, so that they get a heavier fruit set. Uh, so if you're looking at seed catalogs and that sort of thing, especially in cucumbers, you'll see this word gynoecious or even this word parthenocarpic, uh, which means that the plants don't even have to be fertilized. They have crossbred and bred them so that the, the fruit will form even without male flowers. And a lot of times this will be this, the plants or the, the fruit that is seedless. Uh, so again, for commercial growers, that can be kind of, kind of helpful and you don't have to worry about um, having enough pollinators or anything like that. So lots of words, <laughs> but uh, mainly just wanted to let you guys know that if you see those, those terms, um, like in seed catalogs, uh, what it could be meaning. And uh, some really cool things about squash is that there are tons and tons of native bees that help with pollination. Uh, because we have the separate male and female flowers, we have to have some way to get the pollen from one to the other. And that's often through um, animal pollinators such as honeybees and, and native bees and that sort of thing. Uh, so this is actually squash bees. And this uh, was a snippet from the United States Department of Agriculture's uh, website. And you can uh, visit it here if you click on this link once you get the presentation. Uh, but you can see these squash bees that are, again are uh, specialists, so they focus just on the squashes, and a lot of the males will actually sleep uh, right in the flower. So if you go out to your garden early, early in the morning, sometimes before the squash flowers are even open and you look in there, uh, sometimes you'll be able to catch these guys that are just hanging out um, in there until it gets warm enough for them to start being active. So be on the lookout, and that's something fun to look for this uh, spring and summer as you start your, your vegetable gardens. And then just some more uh, information about pollination. So sometimes if you're not getting great fruit set or your, um, if your fruits are sometimes misshapen, that can be a pollination problem. Uh, so this kind of just tells you how many hours, you know, the flowers are open uh, and it can kind of help you focus, especially if you're gonna go out and do some sort of hand pollination yourself um, or something like that. So again, uh, this is, it's one of the problems that we tend to see, uh, and it's usually a pollination problem where we get deformed fruit on one end or the other. Sometimes it can be misshapen. Uh, again, sometimes it's lack of pollinators due to it being too cool so early in the season or if we get a rainy spell and you know, the bees can't fly as easily, uh, sometimes we'll see uh, this misshapen fruit. And just a quick note, a lot of people think that you know, cross-pollination could affect uh, your fruit, but you will not have any issues for this season. The only time you really need to worry about your plants cross-pollinating would be if you were going to try to save the seeds for future years. So uh, sometimes people throw, you know, um, rotted fruit or inedible fruit into their compost pile, and then a lot of times, you know, pumpkins and cucumbers and squash can kind of come back and have a whole completely different look. And that is because, you know, cross-pollination the previous year, and then, you know, you threw those, those pumpkins or rotted gourds out there, and then um, that's when you're gonna see the effect of cross-pollination. But it doesn't hurt you to eat those plants or anything like that. Um, so yeah, just something to think about. Uh, just in general, with we talk about uh, weed management, of course, anytime we have weeds, it's gonna be competing for our desired crop. So, you know, they're gonna be competing for space and sunlight and nutrients and especially water. Uh, so always, it's always a good idea, no matter what plant you're growing, uh, to keep your weeds away if possible. If you can do nothing else, just uh, physically remove them by pulling them. Sometimes that can be difficult. Um, I found that on large areas, sometimes a weed eater works well just to mow them off so they don't go to seed, uh, especially late in the season. And of course, mulches. Uh, so we have two basic types of mulches, synthetic with like your plastics. Uh, they can help, either type of mulch can help warm the soil earlier. Uh, so landscape fabrics, uh, they can let enough soil moisture go through so that they're permeable. Uh, they're more like, um, like a plastic, but I guess they're more woven, uh, your synthetic mulches, your landscape fabrics, so they're a little bit easier uh, to leave on year round if you want to do that. Um, but then we have this other category of organic mulches, which, which works pretty nice for these sprawling uh, crops as well. So some examples of organic mulches would be straw or newspaper or even grass clippings. 
And again, they can be put down all around the plant uh, to kind of help keep like your pumpkins and your, your gourds and um, your winter squashes up off the ground so that they're not, you know, right on the soil surface where sometimes they can rot or I've even had um, like roly poly bugs. Sometimes if it's really wet, that'll try to dig in there just because uh, the, the fruit is laying there on the ground. Uh, and drip irrigation, we've talked about this a little bit in some of our other sessions, uh, but it's a great tool to help, you know, save money and save water because the water is actually getting right to the roots of the plants. Um, it can also help with preventing diseases um, because a lot of fungal diseases are going to be spread by that splashing rain. So by having the soil or the water right at the soil line, uh, we don't have to worry nearly as much with it splashing up onto the leaves and onto the, the fruit. It's always a good idea to grow vertically to help save space and a lot of the plants in this family uh, will put little, um, I just love the word, tendrils out uh, to, you know, climb on and, and crawl right up whatever you give them uh, to grow up. So that's kind of a good idea to try. Uh, it can also, again, provide shade and other growing space for other things in your garden. So we're going to talk specifically about um, a few of the really popular garden plants in this family. Uh, and we're going to start with cucumbers. Uh, so they're a really old crop. You know, they've been cultivated for more than 3,000 years. And um, there's lots of different varieties, lots of different shapes, uh, different plant types. Basically, we have bush or vining. If you're going to try to grow them in a container or a small space, I recommend trying to get a bush variety. They may not produce quite as many, uh, but it's going to save you a lot of headaches because the, the plant's not going to get nearly as large. Uh, the other fun thing I love about cucumbers is how quickly they mature, uh, especially a lot of the small varieties. You can almost turn them around every 45 days. Uh, so that's pretty quick for a vegetable. Uh, some other things, uh, they do like compost, so you can always work that in prior to planting. And if you're having trouble with, um, you know, getting them to produce well, you can give them a dose of fertilizer as they begin to blossom and every three weeks after that. Some more things about cucumbers. Again, they take a lot of space, so I've always planted them in hills, so, you know, three to four seeds, maybe five to six on a hill and then separate each hill out uh, three feet apart. Uh, give them plenty of room to, to run and to sprawl. Again, the more often that you plant these throughout the season, uh, it can help with disease and insect pressure because you're gonna have a new plant coming on uh, to then pick up where maybe some of your other plants are starting to, uh, to die off. Remember that you know, overripe cucumbers, that's when they become more bitter and seedy. So picking them small. Um, if you are going to pick a large cucumber, you can always cut the seeds out and peel it uh, to still salvage it if you want to try to use that. They also work well for pickles uh, and things like that. So I was trying to put together the different types of cucumbers because I think that's interesting, but I soon got overwhelmed with that task. I thought that it would be very to the point, but um, I soon found out that there are a lot of different varieties of cucumbers or a lot of different types out there now. Uh, so hopefully this will be um, helpful to you. Pickling, that's a pretty good category that I found a lot of, but they're going to be mainly shorter, good for fresh eating, or good for pickling, uh, as the name states. Uh, slicing are going to be your more common ones that we see, especially if you think about you know, like your market more, your straight eights, just, uh, you know, a, a cucumber that's going to have some spines, but not a ton. Um, and they're going to, you know, be good smaller, or they're going to be good as they get a little bit larger too. And then there are some new uh, categories like cocktail. Uh, I saw this in a lot of different seed catalogs. So Traditionally, they're going to be, you know, much smaller, three to four inches. A lot of times these varieties are going to be sold, you know, like in a clamshell container, like in your grocery store, uh, usually pretty thin skinned, um, very few seeds and that sort of thing. And then we get into, I found different names for them. Sometimes they were Dutch, sometimes English, Armenian, or even Persian. Uh, and basically, I had a hard time telling a big difference between all of these. But a lot of times, all of these categories or all of these types uh, would be the long, skinny, very thin-skinned types that you see, again, in grocery stores that are often uh, wrapped by themselves in saran wrap or like a plastic wrap uh, because the skins are so thin they can dry out pretty quickly. 
So just things to look for. I've always seen them sold as English, but again, uh, Dutch was one seed catalog's way to describe it. And then Armenian and Persian were um, pretty close in, in uh, descriptions as well. And then of course we have uh, burpless cucumbers. So again, some seeds, some companies don't really want to main it, don't want to market them as saying burpless. So sometimes you'll see bitter free or less bitterness um, in the seeds or in the, yeah, the seeds or the skin. So uh, there was this another term called bait alpha uh, that I saw being referred to again, kind of like as a burpless uh, thin skin variety. So lots about cucumbers. Uh, they can be kind of hard to uh, pick uh, or harvest. So I've always used like um, clippers or even a knife, uh, the less damage you do to this end where, you know, the stem end, uh, the longer they're going to keep and it's less, you know, less area for bacteria or, or fungus to, to get into the fruit that you um, harvested. So it can make them last a little bit longer. Okay, uh, next we're going to move into melons. Uh, so cantaloupes, muskmelons, um, honeydew, crenshaw melons, they're all in the same the same genus and they tend to have a lot longer growing season. So if you're going to try to grow melons, uh, I would highly recommend that you find a variety that matures in less than 120 days. Uh, that seems to be a lot of the, the day lengths that I see. So, you know, think about, um, you know, smaller varieties, a lot of like individual size and we have some pictures of those are going to be a little bit easier to start with. I've had a lot of uh, trouble with aphids on my melons when I've tried to grow them in the past. Uh, so that's something to think about. Um, again, you can grow them in hills. They will trellis, but the vines aren't nearly, um, I've had more trouble getting them to trellis than like with a cucumber. And they may not be suitable for small gardens uh, just because, again, because they're gonna sprawl. And, with this sprawling vine, you're not going to get a ton of melons, but uh, you will get a few. Uh, so here are two varieties, uh, Minnesota Midget up above and then Tiger below. Uh, so they kind of market these now as individual serving sizes. So they, you know, like the size of a, a large baseball or maybe a softball, uh, just enough for one person to eat. So that's kind of fun, new varieties to try. And then watermelons, again, I've I've tried a couple of different varieties. Again, the smaller ones uh, tend to be a little bit better, especially in Garrett County. Uh, some of them can get huge, you know, up to 200 pounds, but you're going to take a, you're going to need a long growing season for that. And a lot of times, you know, you'll get melons, but you may not get ripe melons. So that can be a little frustrating too. Again, what, this is one single plant uh, here on this uh, black plastic. Uh, so again, it takes a lot of space. So just be, be aware of that. You can get seedless varieties. Uh, so that can kind of be fun, uh, a little bit easier once you're actually you know, eating them. So think about that too, when you're picking out these different varieties to try. Uh, you do want to fertilize when the, the vines begin to start to run um, or right as they begin to set their first fruit and they need a lot of water. So, you know, they're saying an inch of natural rainfall per week. Uh, and you do want to stop watering when, when the fruits begin to ripen. That's going to kind of like tell the plant that it, it needs to focus more on, on the fruit and not so much on the vine. Okay, this is kind of a cool slide and I will, Say at the beginning, we, we had John Tronfeld's name and a couple of master gardeners that helped put this presentation together. Um, we kind of added and adapted it to our needs, but uh, this was one of the slides that was in the original presentation. So um, in Japan, because they have limited refrigerator space, uh, they have found that it's a better marketing tool to have the watermelon be square <laughs> so they can stack them and stack other things around them. Uh, so they put the small watermelon into these little boxes and then it forms uh, that perfectly square. So that's kind of cool that this uh, plant will do that. Uh, seems like a lot of work to me, um, but definitely something cool to see. Uh, they do have very distinctive leaves, uh, much different than any of the other plants in this family. Uh, and here would be a cool heirloom variety, yellow uh, watermelon, which just doesn't seem quite right to me, <laughs> but I'm sure it would definitely be a conversation piece. And it's yellow moon and stars. And now we are going to roll into a summer squash and Sherry is going to tell us more about that. 
Okay. I, I love this slide because <laughs> as many of you who have grown zucchini know that they can be prolific producers. So uh, you may not need as many plants as you think you need. Uh, and near the end of the summer, uh, people are locking their car doors in their driveway because they know that their neighbor's gonna try and stuff some uh, zucchinis in there, right? <laughs> so uh, August 8th is National Sneak Zucchini on your neighbor's porch day, but now you can get caught. Most people got ring.com, right? So anyway, uh, most people enjoy having zucchini. Um, I also like to have some uh, straight or crookneck yellow squash too to go along with that, just to mix and match green and yellow when you're cooking, it looks really nice. Um, you can plant bush types, like a, maybe a patio type or bush type if you have a smaller space. Um, so keep that in mind. Next slide. Um, so with the summer squash, uh, once again, you're gonna plant these in hills and somebody asked, you know, uh, how do you make your hills? Uh, somebody, or Ashley, you can um, tell me how you do it. I, I usually just make a hill about, you know, six inches high and maybe a foot and a half across, something like that. And then space the hills about four feet apart. Yep. Yeah. That's okay. Exactly. That's how I do it too. Okay. Right. And, you know, and sometimes in, in production systems, um, farmers might plant them just in a single row, but plant them every couple of feet, you know, so you have, um, you know, a plant every foot and a half, two feet, depending on the variety and how much space they need. So uh, that's another way that you can do it. And these are average uh, feeders as far as fertilizer goes, nothing special there. Um, and you can hand pollinate if you want to, and that's a, a whole nother subject uh, once again. But um, in this slide, you see that uh, someone is collecting pollen from the male flower, right? And then you're going to go to the female pollen with that pollen and then place that on the, um, the, the stigma of the, of the female plant to fertilize. And you could do it. Maybe you could do your own kind of cross-pollination uh, experiments. You can do that if you like. So, um, and yeah, that's the end of that one. Go to the next one. So. Uh, Probably the best time to harvest these is when they're six to eight inches long. My dad actually likes to wait till they're a foot or 14 inches long or so. It, it's all according to what you like. My dad uh, will scoop out the insides and then do a uh, stuffed squash recipe with rice and ground beef and cheese and stuff. And it's really nice. Um, but generally most people like when they're smaller because they're more tender and they don't, they're not as spongy, you know, because uh, a large proportion of that fruit is going to be seeds if you let them get really big. All right, next slide. And some other types here besides your zucchinis would be the patty pan or scalloped, um, the yellow straight neck squash. Um, I've tried patty pan. I don't think I'm as big a fan, but uh, I, I know like my um, older relatives used to grow it and like it very much. Next slide. You can try and prevent some fruit rot disease by removing the blossoms from the uh, enlarging fruit. And you'll see in this picture on the right, you look at this leaf. Uh, I have had people call in and say, is there something wrong with my zucchini? Does it have a disease? No, that's just the natural way it looks. It almost kind of looks like the, um, the layers of the leaf are delaminating. Uh, but that's just, that's natural. That's okay. Next slide. Okay, so now we get into like my favorite subject is winter pumpkins and, or winter squash and gourds. Um, I'm a, I'm a, a gourd growing weirdo. Okay, sorry. I like to dry them and then make all kinds of crafts out of them. But uh, I'd say winter squash just makes me happy. There are all kinds out there. Um, some of the species would be your uh, Cucurbita pepo or Maxima or Moshata. That's those are the ones we're going to be focusing on right now, um, and that would include your butternut, acorn, spaghetti, pumpkin, and gourds. And gourds are uh, another sort of a different tribe, um, Leganaria. So we'll talk about them in a moment. Um, they do tend to take a lot of space. Uh, you can try to uh, trellis them. I the smaller ones, like if you have really big pumpkins, they're gonna to need to be on the ground because um, uh, the vines won't be able to support that weight. But uh, your smaller uh, winter squashes and gourds are fine to grow on a trellis. That'll save you some space. Um, and you wanna harvest them when the, the skins are you know, a little tough. Um, and they do take a long time to grow. So if you have a short growing season, try and find one that's um, got a shorter, been bred to have a, a shorter growing season. So um, these are, you know, grown very similar to what we've talked about before in hills or in rows. 
um, you know, in a hill you want to, I, I usually um, do about six seeds in a hill and then thin it to three and then have those hills, you know, four or five feet apart. Probably some of them need to be farther apart than that, maybe even up to eight feet. It depends on how long these vines grow for the different species, but um, you can also plant them like um, a, a grower would do in a, in a row, about one seed every about every two uh, feet or so, and then those rows need to be like eight feet apart. Okay, um, so you want to fertilize at planting and then three weeks after the blossoming begins, but don't make the mistake that I made in the past, which is you get all excited and you think, oh, I see all these flowers and the fruit is going to start to grow. And then after they flower, uh, you, you put down too much nitrogen, which I have done. And what you're going to get is a lot of vine and a lot of leaves and not a lot of fruit. So don't over fertilize, okay? Um, and if, if you want, you can try and prop them up a little bit to keep them from rotting on the ground. It's nice if you have some mulch for them to grow on, uh, might be a little less likely to get rot. Okay, so uh, as I had mentioned earlier, you wanna harvest them when the, the rinds are hard and firm um, and um, storage for them is, I, I, I don't have any problem. I bring them, I, I let them set outside in the sun for a couple of days. Uh, that kind of helps that outer rind to toughen up a little bit. Uh, you don't want to be able to, you know, just poke your fingernail through it. The, the skin should be tough. That's going to help it to last for months in storage. You know, a lot of these winter squashes can go several months, three and some of up to six months in storage, which is really fabulous. Um, when you, you do bring them in, keep in mind that they're going to have a lot of field heat. And as they cool down, you might get some condensation on the on the underneath side of the pumpkin. I've had that happen, having them sit on the floor uh, and you don't know there's a bunch of wetness under there. So um, you want to check that and you might need to wipe some of that off. Uh, I also have a uh, shelf with perfor perforated shelving, so I, you don't have as much of a problem with that. The you, know, you get air circulation and they dry off. Um, there's just all kinds of ways you can prepare winter squash, and I'm going to talk about a few of them in the next slide. Okay, so we've got um, your spaghetti squashes, uh, Kirkabita uh, pepo. Um, now, if you want to have, these are really cool because the, um, you can cook them, you roast them or boil them, and then the inside you can scoop out and it's like uh, noodles, uh, just long threads of the, the vegetable flesh like noodles. Um, but if you want the long threads as opposed, to as opposed to like real short pieces, instead of cutting it lengthwise, cut it crosswise because the, the threads threads that are growing in that uh, squash are growing around like this. If like, if you have the fruit like this and they're growing around like this. So if you cut them lengthwise, you're making them really short. But if you cut them in um, crosswise, even in rings and then roast it, you'll get much longer noodles from that. Um, then we have this kind of gray blue looking squash over here called a Hubbard um, that is in the, in the Maxima species. And uh, that's an heirloom variety. Uh, the seeds came from, they believe came from uh, South America or maybe the, the Caribbean somewhere, West Indies, and uh, it brought back in, in to New England and there was a lady, Mrs. Hubbard, who grew them and she shared them with people. And then somebody started um, actually, you know, selling the seeds. And that's kind of the heirloom story behind that. And then we have our butternuts, which are delicious. Um, I like growing those too. Those are the Moshada species. And uh, butternuts and Hubbards are very good keepers. And in fact, Hubbards, a lot of time, the flesh from that is used uh, in, in pumpkin pie filling. Okay, next slide. And then we have some of your um, probably less uh, uh, often grown ones. Uh, see this pink banana at the top? I try. I was like, what is that? But I, so I tried that one year and I was amazed. I mean, they are big. I mean, they're like, you know, I don't know, a foot and a half long or so. And um, there's a lot of flesh in there and I just cut it in rings. You know, you scoop out the seeds and roast it and it is very delicious. And uh, on the bottom right corner, you see kind of what looks like a gourd. It uh, looks like a little mini pumpkin with those orange stripes. It's beautiful. And I bought them just for fall decoration. And I was like, well, I'll try and eat one. You just uh, cut off the top and scoop out the seeds and bake it. Um, you could put applesauce in it, whatever. I mean, it was delicious. So who knew, right? I didn't know that it was also good to eat too. Um, the one up at the, the top left-hand corner, uh, this is a kabocha 
style um, winter squash. It's like a ja it's a Japanese variety, and it's in the buttercup family. Okay, I tell you what, um, there's a couple of varieties that I just think are fantastic, and I'm going to say this, and I'll probably have to type it out for you later because you're like, what? It's called Tetsu Kabuto. Okay, that has got to be the best tasting winter squash and texture that I've ever had. Beautiful. Um, it's kind of a, almost a creamy, but firm texture, uh, nutty flavor. But with that particular variety, you need a cross pollinator. So it would need to be a Hubbard or a butternut. Um, a, a one that's a little easier to grow would be a Sweet Mama. Excellent, excellent keeper. Um, nice mm, fruit, I don't know, maybe a couple of pounds or somewhere around there. Okay, and below we have some other um, winter squashes that you know you might think could be decorative, but they're also edible. So um, you see the, the bright orangish red one. This is one of my favorites, it's just beautiful. Uh, you might, it's called uh, Cinderella. So you might see it say Cinderella in a catalog. It's a French variety heirloom. Um, another name for it would be a, a Rouge Vif des Um, So that's pretty neat. And uh, growing that, I haven't eaten it, but it is beautiful. Uh, and then I like the next one over, which is kind of a pinkish color. And it looks like it's got all these warty bumps on it. So that's a really cool one. Um, that's called Gallo de Cines. Um, this is an heirloom variety from the Bordeaux area of France, fun to grow. And then um, let's see, my favorite one is the in the bottom left-hand corner. It's oblong, it's cream color with green stripes. Okay, that one is called, um, Delicata. It comes in a bush variety and also the long vining one. And these fruits, I think, are just um, you know perfect to slice them lengthwise, uh, bake them upside down. And yeah, so Michaela likes Delicata too. Thanks, <laughs> Michaela. And uh, they just make perfect serving sizes. Um, put some butter, cinnamon, stuff them, whatever. They're they're wonderful and they do keep well. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about gourds, and um, they're divided into two groups. You've got the small, hard-shelled ornamental groups. That might be the striped ones, um, bicolor ones, or, you know, warty, bumpy. Um, that includes, like, apple, bell, egg, crown of thorns. There's, um, they tend to have a yellow flower that goes along with them. They're used for decoration. Uh, they will cross-pollinate with one another. You get some very interesting variations on them if you would, were to save the seeds and try and plant them. And then you have the utility gourds, which I, I get really excited about because I like to dry them and then make things out of them. And that includes like your dipper, um, your birdhouse, bottle gourds, Okay, uh, all different shapes. Can there's one called a cannonball. There's Corsica. It's kind of like almost like a little squat bowl. There's all kinds out there. It's just really neat. Um, and the, all your gourds here are grown very similarly to what we've already talked about with the uh, other cucurbites, um, cucurbites, excuse me. And these vines are vigorous. And let me say something. Uh, these utility gourds, um, they have they tend mostly have white flowers, but I hardly ever have any insect problems with them. And the only disease issues I might have would be um, powdery mildew. So they do pretty good, but they do vine a lot. So they need a lot of uh, space. Next slide. So here we have some uh, pictures of some very beautiful different kinds of gourds. Um, you got your crown of thorns and um, like your little mini pumpkins right there next to it in the orange, uh, very beautiful. I love buying them in the fall. And then you go over to the next one is a bottle gourd up in the upper right hand corner. Um, they can come in different shapes, um, dipper gourds, which we'll see in the next slide. Below that is are gonna be those smaller gourds I was talking about. And um, they are actually in the uh, Cucurbita pepo family. Okay, and they have the yellow flowers and um, they're just a lot of fun. And then over here in the left lower corner is a uh, speckled swan, which are very beautiful. And you can dry those and make things out of them. Next slide. Here's a loofah. Um, I have never grown this, but you know, you can you can eat it when it's small, which is interesting. Um, or you can let it grow to a full maturity, you know, till it's you know end of the season. And then you can make these really cool, you know, loofah sponges out of that for cleaning or for using in, you know, 
in the shower or whatever. So they're pretty neat. Um, you want to harvest those when the skin is yellow, and then you remove that. Um, and you do that by soaking them. And uh, I've never done it, but uh, it looks like it would be a fun project to try. Um, next slide, please. OK, and uh, here you see an example of a dried um, dipper board over there, and that's pretty cool. So uh, when you go to harvest gourds because you want to dry them and make something out of them, you know, just let them go to the end of the season um, until you, you know, before you get a frost. And, um, and then I would cut them off of the vine. And um, they are going to get moldy and you are going to get fungus on it and it's going to look unsightly. So choose your place wisely where you're going to let them sit and dry over the winter. Um, you can leave them outside, and I have done that, um, you, but you can get some damage on them. Um, and also, you leave them out too long, and they start to degrade. So uh, someplace you might want to consider doing it is in the shed, right? Someplace where you don't have to look at it for months. And then when you're ready, um, then you're going to need to clean them off with some bleach. And you might need to, you know, um, soak them a little bit to get that outer uh, skin off if it's still on there. And, um, and they can just be a lot of fun to work with. Um, and an another thing I forgot to mention is, is when you harvest them, you might want to uh, do like a 10% bleach solution on them, just to kind of help with um, fungus and stuff like that. Okay, next slide. Oh, this is, um, I just wanted to show you something you can make out of a gourd. Um, this is from a cannonball gourd. I mean, it's, it's huge, it's like, um, like this big. And um, it's really neat to grow it. And um, I actually uh, car or did some wood burning on this gourd after I dried it. And then um, you can use uh, leather dyes or inks then to color the, the flesh or you know, the gourd itself. And, um, and then I finish it with some kind of a wax or polyurethane or something. So that's a lot of fun. Next slide. Okay, so now we are gonna move into um, pest and disease management strategies. And I'm probably not gonna spend a lot of time on this because we are uh, going a little bit long, but it is important to incorporate a variety of methods to try and keep pests and diseases under control. And we usually put them into four categories, such as biological, physical, cultural, and chemical controls. And we wanna try and do the biological, cultural, and physical ones um, first, before we run to the chemicals, we want to do, you know, least amount of chemicals necessary and the least toxic to the environment and to people. All right, next slide. So some just some basic um, strategies would to always grow the right plant in the right place, remove weeds, which Ashley already talked about, because um, you need to have good air circulation around your plants. And also they can harbor diseases. They can harbor your pest insects. So keep those weeds down. Um, you want to plant um, flowers or herbs that are going to invite other beneficial insects to come in that will help keep those pests down. Um, and we want to try and use reduced risk organic pesticides as a last resort. And uh, physical barriers such as row covers do wonders. All right, next slide. So this is just a, um, a slide to, to give you an example of different plants that you could uh, have in your, you know, you wanna have a variety, you wanna have uh, diversity and that will invite a host of different species in that will, you'll have a, you know, a more rounded, better rounded ecosystem in your yard that, you know, you'll have um, beneficial insects and other organisms that will help keep your pest insects down. All right, and, and those, um, organisms, those beneficials like to eat the, the pollen and the nectar, or they may use those plants as uh, host plants for developing, uh, for their uh, development for, you know, pupa or flora, whatever. Okay, so um, when you invite these beneficial insects in, they, help, they are a type of bene, uh, biological control. They are gonna eat pest insects like uh, white flies, aphids, mealybugs, they can eat the, the eggs of pest insects, they may eat small caterpillars, uh, et cetera. So um, this one in particular is a uh, lacewing. And on the left, you see the larva, it's called an aphid lion. It loves to eat aphids, um, it eats a lot of them. You can invite these into your yard uh, with yarrow, coriander, dill, fennel, and cosmos among others. Next slide. 
And here's some other natural predators. Um, you got the assassin bug, you got a spider, which is more of a generalist predator. And then we have some lady beetle larva on the bottom left-hand corner. And, and that diversity of, of uh, flowers and herbs in your garden is gonna invite these guys in. And don't, don't squish them, they're good. Next slide. And um, this is also something interesting, um, I don't know if you're familiar with, but there are parasitoid wasps out there that will uh, lay their eggs in pest insects like uh, aphids, and that will help get your aphid population under control. Next slide. So a lot of times people are interested in knowing what are some organic insecticides that are out there, and I've got them. We got them listed here. Um, they are reduced risk or they are uh, derived from botanical things or bacteria and very specific to the insect that you want to uh, control. So uh, I'm not going to read through all these, uh, you know, and their descriptions, but um, just like to say spinosad is very, uh, very useful. This is a bacteria uh, that does help to control a lot of different insects and it works by being ingested by the insect. Um, this bacteria was found in the Caribbean at an old abandoned um, rum distillery and a uh, pretty unique species. So it's very, very useful. And BT is very specific specific for controlling caterpillars of moths and butterflies, and it also has to be ingested. The other ones work by contact. So um, you actually have to contact the insect with it in order for them to be um, effective. All right, next slide. And so floating row covers are very helpful because they act as the actual physical barrier between your plant and the insect and even deer or rabbits, okay? And, uh, but if you use them and you have plants that need to be pollinated, um, if, if you got them on a, on a, over a hoop, maybe you could open the, uh, the ends so that pollinators can get into your plants that are under the row cover. If you don't have a hoop system, and then you may need to, um, to just pull that off when you get to the point where your, your plants are flowering. Um, some things that you can make the hoops out of uh, are, um, wire or some uh, polyvinyl piping. Um, I think we might see that in the next slide, Ashley. And so we can see some examples of that. And also um, something else you could consider is this Enviro mesh, which is in the bottom left-hand corner. Um, it's, uh, that's, that, that's pretty neat too. Um, but you're still gonna have to remove that because pollinators won't be able to get into that. But these, um, these things actually you know, let sunlight and water in. So that's a good thing. Next slide. Okay, so we're just gonna talk about a few um, common pest insects for your uh, cucurbita plants. And uh, we're gonna talk about striped cucumber, spotted cucumber, squash bug, and squash vine borer. There are others, but these are the biggest ones. Next slide. Um, and this is a really cool thing you can do to, to help um, kind of reduce the kind of damage that you might see from squash bugs and cucumber beetles and also repels aphids is to plant some uh, nasturtiums in the bottom, bottom right corner and marigolds um, so that these are great companion plants. Next slide. Okay, so we have the spotted cucumber and the striped cucumber beetles. Um, they are not the same species. The spotted cucumber beetle, as you can see over here on the right, um, it is more of a generalist. It feeds on all kinds of plants. Um, the larva may feed on the roots of all kinds of plants, corn, beans, you name it, not just uh, cucumbers and squash. All right, whereas the striped cucumber beetle is um, actually more dependent on it, on uh, the, the cucurba cucurbits for uh, their development. You have, they have to have, um, you know, a squash or a melon or a, a cucumber in order for their larva to develop. So um, they can cause a lot of damage with their feeding. You'll see the holes in the leaves. They can feed on the roots. They feed on the stem. They, you know, they just mm, can be kind of devastating. Next slide. And you'll see some of this damage. Um, the feeding on the end of the cucumber there, it looks, it looks all scabby, right? They even feed on the flowers. You can see the bruising on the petals. Right, next slide. 
So they're kind of hard to control, unfortunately. So we suggest that you use the row cover until your plants are starting to bloom, or you can delay planting into mid-June or so. But if you have a short growing season, that might not be a great option. Um, you can try and find uh, varieties that have a shorter growing season if you want to do that. Um, if you have plants that are really badly infested, you might want to just uh, get rid of them. Um, but the, I think one of the, the, the biggest issues here is that they, they transmit um, diseases that will do your cucumbers and other um, squash in. Next slide. Um, so here we have squash bugs. They have been the bane of my existence here lately. Um, they tend to destroy my zucchinis. Uh, not, I don't see them so much on uh, pumpkins, but not to say that they can't be. So this is a true bug. It has um, piercing sucking mouth parts. It sucks out the, the juices out of the plant, and then it may uh, in turn inject some toxins, which actually will cause uh, parts of the leaf to die. If you have enough of these, it will kill entire leaves and make, if, if you're infested, you know, this is a real problem. So um, they're kind of, they're hard to control with uh, pesticides, especially, you know, the adults. So the best way to help keep these guys under control is to do frequent scouting. And in that next slide, we'll see um, what you should be looking for. You should turn the leaves over and look for eggs and they're kind of these coppery colored eggs. And then you see the little nymphs that have hatched out there. Um, when I see this, I, you know, I'm, I might take the entire leaf or cut out the eggs and uh, put them in the trash. And then if I have something like spinazad, I might try and spray these uh, nymphs and try to get rid of them. Next slide, please. Um, this is something you might see happening to your cucumbers um, or other squashes, et cetera. Um, you think, oh, is it drought? Or it might be something else. Next slide. It could be a squash vine borer, which is a moth, and it lays its eggs um, on the vine, and those uh, caterpillars then develop, and they just kind of eat the stem from the inside out, and they can cause that wilting and just, you know, cause the entire plant to collapse. If you catch it in time, um, you can actually cut the stem open remove that larva and then cover up that stem with soil and then it will reroot. But you, you've got to do frequent scouting for this. Um, and then you have one to two generations per year on this. You can um, spray the bottoms of the stems like close to the ground and maybe up, I don't know, six inches or so uh, with pyrethrins or something to try and, and dissuade them. Um, another thing that I've, I've seen people do is, you know, you could make some kind of a collar around the base of the squash plant, whether it would be tin foil or I've seen some with um, cardboard or someone suggested um, actually athletic tape, wrapping that around the stem. And I think in the next slide, we'll see um, that. Yeah, um, that's pretty much about everything I was talking about. You might wanna consider, um, like, like I said, you know, putting the floating row cover over there until it starts to flower to help, you know, <sighs> ward some of that off. Also, um, butternut squash tend to be less susceptible to the squash bug. Okay, and then I talked about what you can do to, um, you know, help defeat this squash vine borer. I found this um, video on YouTube. Um, this uh, extension agent was, you know, it's just a nice summary of everything we've talked here. If, if talked about here, if you want to um, take a look at it. Okay, next slide. So um, we're gonna move into diseases now and uh, try to be as brief as I can. So basically for, for all diseases, these are basic practices you need to do to help to reduce the incidence of disease. Make sure you've got good air circulation around your plants, which means make sure you're not um, crowding them. Okay, they should be spaced uh, well enough apart. They get good sunshine, like if they're supposed to be in full sun, make sure they're in full sun, not in the shade. Uh, keep the weeds down and uh, make sure you do have good garden sanitation at the end of the year. Clean up all your plant debris, uh, unless you're going to hot compost, put it in the garbage, okay, so that you don't have those spores of fungi or bacteria or whatever it is, you know, floating around to inf infect your plants the next season. Um, try and uh, make sure you get uh, disease-free seed and um, uh, use mulch. Okay, next slide. 
So um, some of the diseases you're frequently going to see are going to be uh, powdery mildew, bacterial wilt, viruses, and you may, may see downy mildew. Next slide. Um, this is a great website to go to to help diagnose uh, disease problems is the Cornell Vegetable MD Online. And this particular link I have there goes to, um, it shows you disease resistant uh, plants in the, the Kirk, 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 Kerbit family there, or I should say genus. All right, next slide. All right, so downy mildew kind of looks like a gray mold. It'll be on the underneath of the, the leaf and on the top side of the leaf, you'll see this um, yellowing and browning and, and, and splotches there. Next slide. This is a, an interesting um, pathogen in that it is a, considered an obligate parasite. It's not quite a fungus, it's kind of odd. So it overwinters in spores, but it has to be someplace warm uh, like Florida. And um, so these spores are actually gonna be brought up from the south um, by the wind to infect your plants. Um, and uh, this, could, this disease can travel long distances and um, this pathogen likes it cool and moist. Um, next slide. And then we have powdery mildew. I think most everybody sees this and is familiar with it. You're, it usually happens near the end of the season. Um, it, it follows warm days uh, with cool, humid nights. It, that's uh, kind of optimum conditions for it. And these uh, spores can overwinter and fall in leaves. So make sure you have good um, cleanup at the end of the year. Some fungicides that can help keep this under control would be neem, sulfur, chlorothalonil, or horticultural oil. Next slide. Bacterial wilt disease. Um, so it, it's kind of going to look like those plants that you saw when you had the squash vine borer. Uh, they look okay in the morning, and then near the end of the day, they look all wilted like that. And you're like, what's going on? And they seem to revive overnight, and then by the end of the day, they look wilted again. Well, it could be a bacteria that has been transmitted by those cucumber beetles. And a way that you can test that is you can cut off a stem, um, stick it in a glass of water, and then if it looks like it's milky, after a while, that's all the bacteria coming out of the stem. And the bacteria are basically uh, clogging up the um, xylem in the plant so that water can't be transported. Next slide. So um, this can kill your plants. And um, it's in order to um, kind of help prevent this, like I said, you can use a row cover until this, the you know, stuff starts flowering, plant later in the season to avoid some of the life cycle of the, of the cucumber beetles. And um, once you, your plants have this, there's, there's not a cure for it. Next slide. All right, and then we just have a little example here of viruses that your um, cucumber plants, et cetera, can get. It just, you'll have very strange coloration patterns. It could be little circles. It could be these blotches of light and green, even white streaks. Um, Viruses are, can be transmitted in seeds, so, uh, but oftentimes they're transmitted by insects that are feeding on your plants. So you, you, once your plant has a, a virus, it cannot be cured. Um, you may want to consider pulling it out and trashing it because uh, feeding insects can then transmit that disease to, to other plants. And then, of course, we have our uh, mammalian and bird friends um, who like, also like to, to eat the <laughs> Our, our fruits here, and you see that squirrel enjoying some kind of winter squash. So you gotta try and fence them out or whatever is you need to do. But anyway, I think that's uh, coming up on the end of our presentation. Here is a beautiful mound of quite the variety of winter squashes. Um, I took this picture also at the um, Country Living Fair, so that was pretty cool. All right. So I think at the end here, Ashley may have um, just one or two questions for you with a poll. Yes, I will put those poll questions up. Um, in the meantime, we had one uh, comment about how hard squash bugs are to con control. So I suggested again, the more nasturtiums and hand picking, but if you have anything else, I just said, we're not, you're not alone in that fight. So it, it's hard. Yeah, I mean, you have to constantly scout and cut, getting rid of the eggs is one of the best ways. But I've also decided because I had such a problem, I'm just gonna skip growing anything in the cucurbit family in my yard for at least one year, which is really sad. But 
sometimes you have to do that to kind of break the the life cycle. Oh, Sherry, that's extreme. Good for you. <laughs> that makes that's me a good, bad. good thought, though. That's a good good advice. If if it gets bad, that might be a good way to go. But they're just awful. I just I don't know. I wish I had a magic yeah. cure for them, but yeah, I, I know. I'm going to write the name of that Japanese um, squash I mentioned. Okay, great. It's a little bit longer for this, this poll question, but we thank y'all for joining us today. And we hope you are inspired, uh, you know, to, to try something new, try a new variety. Yeah. I'm excited. I think I want to try loofah sponges. You've inspired me, Shara, Sherry. Yeah, Michaela says she's, uh, she's going to try it. Yeah, it was, or, oh, yay. I hear all about that, Michaela, about your loofahs. Yes, me too. They sound fun. Yeah. All right. If anybody has other questions or anything else to add, please put them in the chat. Um, but we thank you all for joining us again today. We will be sending out a copy of the recording as well as a copy of the slides in the next few days. And we have one class left in our series, and it'll be about um, companion plants and, and flowers that you can kind of incorporate into your vegetable garden for uh, cutting and also just to help um, benefit your vegetables as well. So. All right, Thanks, with Brad. that, thank you. We're gonna stop the recording and we'll stay on a few seconds, but thanks again for joining us. Yep, and Gloria, we will be sending